Good morning, everyone. So today uh, we are going to talk about a new topic in pediatrics. And after doing this topic, I'll enter into the hematology. And the topic today is approach to a child with a lymphadenopathy. So this is a more of a clinical topic. Clinical means when you start working in the hospital um, and start, uh, you know, looking the pediatric cases, if some child comes with enlargement of the lymph node, how do we proceed further? How to take history? How to do physical exam? And how to order investigations? Okay, so these are the things. Now, let's start with the definition. What do we mean by lymphadenopathy? Lymphadenopathy refers to node that are abnormal in either size, consistency, or number. But the most important point here is size. Lymphadenopathy means lymph nodes are usually larger in size. And when we palpate those lymph nodes or feel those lymph nodes, usually sometimes they are hard, sometimes they are soft, okay? Sometimes they are of normal consistency. Consistency means feeling of the node, how they feel when we palpate it, okay? We'll talk about all these things later on. And number, of course, if there are, you know, multiple uh, lymph nodes which are enlarged in size, this is always abnormal. Now, regarding the classification, we classify them under generalized and localized. Generalized lymphadenopathy means if lymph nodes are enlarged in two or more non-contiguous area. Now, non-contiguous area means the area which are not adjacent to each other. Okay, the areas which are not adjacent to each other. Now, we are talking about lymph node group here. If the lymph node groups which are not adjacent to each other and they are enlarged, we call it generalized lymphadenopathy if it occurs in two or more group. So if cervical lymph nodes are enlarged and inguinal lymph nodes are enlarged, then definitely this is a case of generalized lymphadenopathy. Whereas localized means only one area is involved, like right side of the cervical lymph node, left side of the cervical lymph node, axillary lymph node, inguinal lymph node, these are the groups. So if only one area is affected, we call it localized. Okay, so let's move further. So after knowing the definition, now let's see this picture here. Generalized lymphadenopathy comprises of 25% of the lymphadenopathy case, whereas localized comprises almost 75% of the case. So localized is far common than generalized one. See this, head and neck lymphadenopathy in 55%, supraclavicular around 1% only, axillary 5% and inguinal 14%. So head and neck are the cervical lymphadenopathy are the commonest presentation in the hospital or clinic. Now, this is the meaning of a contiguous lymphadenopathy. See this? These are adjacent to each other. So this is contiguous. And for the definition of generalized lymphadenopathy, it should not be contiguous, okay? It should be non-contiguous in two or more different area. Remember this. This is the diffuse type of, uh, you know, lymphadenopathy. So you can uh, consider this as a generalized lymphadenopathy, this one, the second picture. The first is not a generalized lymphadenopathy. It's a part of localized one. Now, let's move further. Bilateral anterior cervical lymph node up to two centimeter in diameter often are found in older healthy children or in those children who are experiencing a recently recovering from URTI. Now, what does that mean? Okay, lymphadenopathy is very common in children because children offer, suffer from, often suffer from upper respiratory tract infection or URTI, like common cold, like tonsillitis, pharyngitis, and those sort of things. Very, very common in children, especially, you know, uh, under five year age group, or sometimes even more than that. So remember one thing, uh, if you remember, we have discussed this before. In a topic of assessment of growth, I have shown you three or four important graphs there. 
and one of the graph clearly tells us around the age of 6 to 8 year okay that's a maximum you know growth of the lymph node occurs in that time maximum growth of the lymph node occurs that time this is called physiological lymphatic growth so many children when they come to the hospital if they don't have any symptom and if those lymph nodes are palpable if they are not tender okay good normal consistency we ignore them we say these are the physiological enlargement of the lymph node but if there are some symptoms okay and along with that if lymphadenopathy is there then we can never call them physiological one we should rule them out which diseases have caused them okay so this is a very important point now a bit of practical information to you many of those you know kids they are taken to the hospital by their parents saying doctor i can feel a big lymph node in my child's neck and i am very worried for this and the doctor will give antibiotic just like that you know without even examining the child properly this is the wrong way of treating the child usually in this type of setting the enlargement of the lymph node is a physiological one until and unless the child is having some other symptom now another point axillary node up to 1 cm and inguinal node up to 1.5 cm in diameter are also usually considered normal a 1.5 cm inguinal or 2 cm anterior cervical node for example would be considered normal in a child who is aged 7 years but would warrant further investigation in an infant aged 2 month that what i was talking just now because around 6 to 8 years there is maximal growth of the lymphatics or lymph node so if no symptoms are there in a child just palpating the lymph node doesn't make any sense but more than that is or less than that is if these lymph nodes are palpable then we should take it seriously at least try to find out the cause now with this information how to take history if a child is brought to the you know hospital with swelling in the neck or swelling in other parts of the body probably that swelling is because of lymphadenopathy now see here the first question we like to ask is how long the swelling has been noticed and how it progressed to the parent so there are shorter duration lymphadenopathy and longer duration lymphadenopathy now let's talk about them one after other so lymphadenopathy of shorter duration infectious causes like bacterial and viral under bacterial the two of the most important bacteria which causes lymphadenitis are streptococci and staphylococci okay streptococci family and staphylococcus family among the viral we have ebv rubella measles vzv and cmv i'm sure student know the full form of this okay what is ebv yes it is tendon virus very viral virus infectious mononucleosis it causes sir very good epstein barr virus which causes infectious mononucleosis as the acute illness now this is what is the full form virus virus excellent varicella zoster virus it causes chicken pox it causes chicken pox in children and herpes zoster in the adult even adult can suffer from chicken pox and this is cytomegalovirus i'm sure every student know this okay so these are very commonly used short form and everyone should be familiar with this now other uh, causes of lymphadenopathy of shorter duration would be leukemia especially the acute leukemia which may be of shorter duration okay acute leukemia it can be all or aml okay all or aml okay now see here kawasaki disease this is a connective tissue disorder which is very common in children less than 5 years age group and in this condition fever occurs for more than 5 days along with lymphadenopathy and rashes in the body 
we'll talk about this Kawasaki disease under pediatrics, probably in six semesters. Drug reaction can also lead to lymphadenopathy. One of the drug which is very notorious for lymphadenopathy is anti-epileptic drug. What is that? What is the example? Which drug causes lymphadenopathy there? Phenytoin. Phenytoin. Excellent. Phenytoin. Very good. Okay. This is a usually asked question in the exam. So please remember this. Now, let's talk about the lymphadenopathy for longer duration. See this? Tuberculosis and HIV. Okay. This is chronic myeloid leukemia. Chronic myeloid leukemia, CML. Of course, it, it stays there for a longer duration. SLE, JRA, and sarcoidosis. Systemic lupus erythematosus, SLE. Juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Now, when rheumatoid arthritis occurs in children, we call that juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, juvenile term is for the pediatric age group. And sarcoidosis is uh, idiopathic granulomatous inflammation where generalized lymphadenopathy occurs. So you will study the sarcoidosis under respiratory system diseases in medicine. Another is Gausser disease and Nyman Pick disease. Now this guy, Gausser and Nyman Pick diseases are called lipid storage disorder. Okay, they are lipid storage disorder. Let me write this term for you because these are very, very important knowledge. Lipid storage disorder. Now, in this condition, there is some enzyme which is lacking or deficient and certain abnormal lipids are deposited here and there in different tissues and organs of the body. Gausser disease and Nyman Pick disease. Let's move further. So these are shorter and longer duration. There are so many other examples we can include, but you know, we don't have that much time to discuss, okay? Now, second important point is age. At what age that swelling or lymph node enlargement started? ALL commonly starts at the age of two to six year. ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, ALL. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So this is acute leukemia which uh, develops from lymphocyte, lymphoma. Now, this is the malignancy of lymphatic system, okay? Lymphatic system or lymphoid organ, you can say. Lymphoid organ, lymphoma, uh, it can be Hodgkin's or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So the common age is 15 to 19 year, especially in Hodgkin's lymphoma. And Kawasaki disease usually occurs in less than five year age group. So these are important points for you. Now, regarding the sex, okay, the male child, they have increased chance of trauma and wound infection because they are a bit of, uh, you know, outgoing. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, female babies or female childs are not outgoing or not that, you know, playful, but male usually have increased chance of trauma and wound infection because of that single region. Leukemia and lymphoma are also more common in male child. Whereas female have an increased chance of SLE and GRA. Now this SLE and GRA are called autoimmune disorder. Now remember one thing from today onwards, almost all type of autoimmune diseases apart from few exceptions are more common in female sex. Okay, they are more common in female sex. So this SLE and GRA are autoimmune disorders. So they are of course more commonly seen in female population. Regarding the progression, you know, progression means what is happening to those lymph nodes? Are they increasing in size or not? How fast are they increasing? That's the meaning. So if they are rapidly increasing in size, then we think about malignancy, acute leukemia or metastasis, okay? acute leukemia or metastasis. Now, what do you mean by metastasis? Uh, it uh, moves from primary focus to primary to second. Okay. It has the ability to invade. Exactly. So see there, many students are answering correctly. For example, one malignant tumor is developed in the bone. And from that bone, 
if it has reached to the neck area the cervical lymph nodes are affected in the neck area and the bone which i was talking in in the leg area for example lower end of the femur this is a clear cut case of metastasis because the malignant cells from that site has gone quite far away and affected some other area so this is called metastasis remember this now ask for pain or tenderness okay pain or tenderness sometimes pa parents they have palpated that area and when they are palpating that area child cry because of pain that is called tenderness it is very commonly seen in bacterial adenitis inflammation or infection of those lymph nodes by the bacteria sometimes even malignant lymph nodes are tender or painful usually they are not okay but sometimes they are tender or painful now what is that situation if there is rapid growth and necrosis or hemorrhage occurs inside those lymph nodes then uh, they may you know uh, press here and there for example some nerves may be compressed very near to that area some other tissues may be compressed and because of this there may be pain otherwise usually the malignant lymph node doesn't cause any pain take a history about discharge if any discharge is coming from there or not now remember in surgery you have talked about a tuberculous lymphadenitis which very commonly forms sinus there and from that sinus there is a discharge we call that collapses okay and uh, in the bacterial adenitis they usually leads to abscess formation that abscess can also rupture and there may be discharge so in tuberculosis we use the term cold abscess whereas in other condition we call that pus and that pus has a many other different characteristic feature okay so let's move on now we are moving on to the very important part of today's lecture what are the causes of generalized lymphadenopathy important question for you in your exam so the common infections which cause generalized lymphadenopathy are tuberculosis rubella measles cytomegalovirus infection hiv epstein barr virus infection varicella zoster virus infection toxoplasmosis and histoplasmosis now among them whenever you are studying like this you know quickly at least you should be able to tell which type of microorganism are they are they bacteria are they viruses are they fungus or are they parasite that much information should be there from microbiology knowledge so tuberculosis is a bacteria it is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis rubella measles cmb hiv evv and vzv all of these are viruses okay these are viruses toxoplasma belongs to which family parasite it is a cellular parasite parasite exactly that is the proto eukaryote sir exactly you can say this is a okay protozoa okay protozoa and metazoa these are the two big classification under parasite so toxoplasma gondii is a type of protozoa histoplasma is a fungus okay you all know that it's a type of fungus so all of these can cause generalized lymphadenopathy malignancy can also lead to generalized lymphadenopathy and the examples are primary and secondary secondary is also known as metastatic so primary malignancy hodgkins disease and non hodgkins lymphoma hodgkins disease is also known as hodgkins lymphoma okay because they develop right there inside the lymph node that's why we call them primary whereas metastatic means it has come there okay from somewhere else the primary is some some in other some other area and uh, because of metastasis those lymph nodes are affected like leukemia neuroblastoma and rhabdomyosarcoma now uh, yes, you should be able to tell okay where are the primary for these malignant tumor so what is the primary for leukemia from where it develops yes 
what is the origin for, of leukemia anyone bone marrow exactly bone marrow okay don't bone get bone marrow exactly very easy question it is from bone marrow from those bone from bone marrow there are pluripotent or multipotent stem cells those stem cells are the origin of leukemia in layman term we call this blood cancer okay but we don't use that term among us when we talk we call it leukemia this is known as hematological malignancy neuroblastoma what is the primary where is the primary said so the neuroblastoma can also start from the start from some adrenal, adrenal region, plan. but not from the neck chest or the abdominal region as well start from the spinal region as well okay good good answer okay so you all know please remember neuroblastoma the most important site is the adrenal gland there's no doubt about it adrenal gland adrenal medulla and apart from them any sympathetic ganglia can also develop into neuroblastoma that's what he told so sympathetic ganglia are present in the sympathetic chain on both side of the spinal cord right in the thorax area right in the you know neck area as well so that's why they can develop there also but the most common site is of course adrenal gland rhabdomyosarcoma which type of malignancy is this it is from soft tissue skeletal urinary head and from hollow organs such as bladder or ureter like the bladder or the uterus okay now remember rhabdomyosarcoma means skeletal muscle malignancy this is skeletal muscle this is not smooth muscle so your answer should be accordingly so sometimes you know uh, you are quite confused with leiomyosarcoma and rhabdomyosarcoma remember leiomyosarcoma develops from smooth muscle rhabdomyosarcoma develops from skeletal muscle these are malignant tumors so it can occur anywhere wherever there is uh, you know skeletal muscle present now another types of uh, you know causes of generalized lymphadenopathy are autoimmune diseases like sle systemic lupus erythematosus rheumatoid arthritis also known as juvenile rheumatoid arthritis in pediatric age group and dermatomyositis polymyositis okay these are the other example let's move on lipid storage diseases are also the cause of generalized lymphadenopathy and the examples are gauss disease and nyman pick diseases gausser and nyman pick apart from lymphadenopathy they also cause hepato splenomegaly okay hepato splenomegaly and they also can cause affection of the central nervous system one of the very important point please note it i'm going to write it here for you in this type of disorder apart from lymphadenopathy there is affection of the central nervous system so there is developmental okay developmental regression now what do you mean by regression regression means the child has already developed those milestones after that child gets these particular diseases the milestone which the child has learned the child will forget it the child will go back according to the developmental milestone or stage for example the child has already learned to walk but after gausser disease or nyman pick disease the child will not walk anymore this is called developmental regression never forget it okay so many children in our clinic or pediatric hospital present in this way and this is one of the common presentation of lipid storage disorders now other are drug reaction look at the drugs phenytoin carbamazepine even penicillin sulfonamide and captopril so penicillin sulfonamide and captopril are very rare causes of lymphadenopathy but phenytoin and carbamazepine okay can also be included in the list are more common than them okay phenytoin is absolutely favorite example from here and others are sarcoidosis don't forget it this is idiopathic 
granulomatous inflammation where okay lymph node, lymph nodes uh, 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 lymphadenopathy occurs in most areas of the body and lungs are also very commonly affected okay let's move on now with this uh, let's talk about what are the causes of regional or local lymphadenopathy regional or local these are the same term now a particular group of lymph nodes lymph nodes are enlarged in case of regional one so you think about the local disease there so every lymph node has some drainage area if that drainage area is infected or inflamed that lymph node group would be swollen very easy so if cervical lymphadenopathy is occurring then it may be because of streptococci or staphylococcal infection of that lymph node group or drainage area mycobacterial infection both tuberculosis as well as atypical mycobacterial infection atypical mycobacteria like mycobacterium kansasi mycobacterium scrofulaceum mycobacterium avium intracellulare mycobacterium merinum so many examples are there they also leads to cervical lymphadenopathy infectious mononucleosis caused by epstein barr virus kawasaki disease a type of connective tissue disease disorder cat scratch disease okay a type of infectious condition and malignancy so all of these can lead to cervical lymphadenopathy occipital lymph node are enlarged in case of rhodiola infantum rubella and scalp infection caused by tinea okay this tinea is a what is tinea anybody it is a fungus sir it is a fungus very good it's a type of fungus we call them dermatophyte we call them dermatophyte so let me write that for you because these are very important term from right now you have to make a concept of it dermatophytes dermatophyte infection are known as tinea so if tinea capitis scalp infection is called tinea capitis then there is enlargement of the occipital group of lymph node rhodiola infantum is caused by virus okay virus rubella is another viral infection so different examples can be given pre auricular lymph node may be enlarged in eye infection and cat scratch disease now one of the bacteria which cause cat scratch disease anybody know the name of that bacteria which causes cat scratch disease anybody this is a, a bit of difficult name bartonella okay hansley bartonella as well exactly yes, bartonella very good bartonella hansley remember these are quite quite a common question in mcq exam bartonella hansley causes cat scratch disease uh, and the vector is a scratching okay by the cat sub mandibular a uh, lymphadenopathy occurs mainly in tonsillitis very common infection in pediatric age group tonsillitis bacterial tonsillitis viral tonsillitis okay and other causes are also there this is a big topic in itself tuberculosis and lymphoma can also result in submandibular lymphadenopathy let's move on now if axillary lymph nodes are affected we think about upper limb condition okay arm arm is a part of upper limb of course side of the chest wall and some other disorders like cat scratch disease again and some of the malignancy mediastinal lymph nodes are commonly affected or enlarged in tuberculosis definitely tuberculosis the pulmonary tuberculosis is the most common one malignancies like teratoma t cell lymphoma and even leukemia can lead to mediastinal group of lymph nodes enlargement sarcoidosis is another example and histoplasmosis as well this is a fungal infection see this teratoma i'm sure every student know we already talked about this there are uh, different types of tissues present there okay teratoma uh, uh, ectoderm mesoderm and endoderm derivatives are present there and mediastinum is one of the common site for teratoma abdominal 
lymphadenopathy occurs again in abdominal tuberculosis now, mesenteric adenitis, which can be caused by viruses again, and malignancies. Ilio inguinal group of lymphadenopathy occurs in the infection of the leg or groin area. Very important one. Just examine the lower limb from toe to the inguinal region. We'll definitely find some important pathology there. Okay, so these are the causes of regional or local lymphadenopathy. Now, in clinical practice, regional or local lymphadenopathy are much more common than generalized lymphadenopathy. Now, let's continue the history taking. Ask about history of any localizing symptoms or sign, like sore throat, ear or eye discharge, any history of trauma or wound on the body. And who knows, they may be caused by secondary bacterial infection. And we know if bacterial infection occurs in the skin or subcutaneous tissue or in any drainage area, the lymph nodes will be swollen or enlarged. So these are good questions to ask. Ask about rashes over the body. If lymphadenopathy occurs along with rashes, then these are the uh, important points we remember, like viral infection, rubella, okay, Epstein Barr virus, varicella zoster virus, all of these causes rashes along with lymph node enlargement. Kawasaki disease also causes rashes along with lymphadenopathy. Malignancy also causes rashes, but those rashes are spots of the blood, like a bleeding disorder. They are called petechiae, purpura, and ecchymosis. And these occur in malignancy because of platelet problem. Okay, This is known as thrombocytopenia. We'll talk extensively about this in our hematological lectures. Drugs can also cause rashes because of allergy now. SLE and GRA, of course, they cause rashes along with lymphadenopathy because they are connective tissue diseases. So see there, rashes along with lymphadenopathy. You think about these causes. Now, what is pruritus? What do you mean by that? Pruritus. Itching. Itching, sir. Absolutely. This is, exactly. This is itching. Okay, extensive type of itching on the body. This is very commonly seen in Hodgkin's lymphoma and drug reaction. Hodgkin's lymphoma is a type of malignancy. Drug reaction. If a, anyone of us can develop drug reaction, this is entirely, you know, differ according to person to person. Now, let's move on. Let me, uh, you know, discuss some very important points which will help you to diagnose what is the cause of this lymph node enlargement. Ask about the associated symptom along with lymph node swelling, like fever, like weight loss, like night sweat, like cough, like bone or joint pain, and like bleeding from any other site. So many other questions can be asked. So if fever along with lymphadenopathy occurs, then they are seen in infection, leukemia and lymphoma, these are malignancy, drug reaction, JRA and SLE, these are connective tissue disorder. In all of these situation, fever may be there. Weight loss, okay? Weight loss is seen in failure to thrive. Now, failure to thrive uh, is actually a general term where a child is not gaining any weight because of some chronic disorders or diseases in the body. That is called failure to thrive. The child is unable to gain weight if we compare this child with the normal child. It usually occurs in tuberculosis, HIV, malignancy, Gausser, and Nyman Pick disease. These are called lipid storage disorder. All of these are chronic diseases, you know, so there is weight loss, very easy to understand. Night sweat along with lymphadenopathy occurs mainly in tuberculosis and Hodgkin's lymphoma. TB is a very common cause for night sweating. Always ask this question in the history. Low grade fever with night sweat is a feature of tuberculosis. Cough occurs in infection like TB 
because of pulmonary tuberculosis. ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. It can also involve mediastinal lymph node, lymphoma, also mediastinal lymphadenopathy, and sarcoidosis can also result in mediastinal and hilar lymph node enlargement. So there is pressure to the airway. And whenever airways are stimulated, there will be cough. Bone or joint pain along with lymphadenopathy can occur in tuberculosis. Reactive arthritis, usually caused by viruses. Viral infection, bacterial infection, leukemia, lymphoma, secondary malignancies like neuroblastoma, JRA, and SLE. These are connective tissue disease. So very common affection, lymphadenopathy along with bone or joint pain. I need to think about so many differential diagnosis. Okay, so this is a challenging thing for us. So you should take help of good history, physical exam and investigation at the end. Lymphadenopathy along with bleeding from any site, maybe a feature of malignancy or bacterial sepsis. Now, why bacterial sepsis can lead to bleeding? What is the mechanism involved? Anybody? Sir, may I, sir, may I? Yes? Um, sir, in bacterial sepsis, sir, basically, sir, bacterial sepsis, sir, uh, uh, sir, when the bacteria invades, so the, uh, so, sir, the body makes a uh, reaction against it. And, sir, this reaction is uncontrolled, sir, which, uh, sir, which affects the many organs as well. So, sir, in this uh, way, sir, there will be sort of an internal bleeding from different organs, sir, mainly. Okay, okay, fine, good. In Anybody else? Yes, yes, sir. In bacterial sepsis, there are chances of DIC lead to bleeding. Okay, yes, good, good, good. Anybody else? Anybody wants to say? Fine. Okay, now that is the correct answer. Remember, bacterial infection, if it is severe enough, may result in disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. And DIC, of course, leads to bleeding. So if any person comes to our hospital with infection and if that person is bleeding, you know, so this is a very serious condition already. DIC is a feature of severe infection in the body. There are so many other causes of DIC, but right now we are connecting this DIC with infection. And malignancy can result in bleeding because of bone marrow involvement. Whenever bone marrow is affected, there is thrombocytopenia and bleeding is very easy to occur. So let's move on. Now, so many important other histories are left there. Ask about abdominal distension. Ask about the history of jaundice. Ask about the history of shortness of breath or breathing difficulty. Ask about the history of dysphagia or difficulty to swallow. Ask about visual problem and ask about hematuria along with lymph. So if abdominal distension comes along with a lymphadenopathy, then we think about uh, these particular diseases like tuberculosis, HIV, leukemia, lymphoma, okay, connect, uh, different types of connective tissue disorder, different types of lipid storage disorder, and even sarcoidosis. Now, remember, abdominal distension can be because of organomegaly or ascites. Organomegaly means hepatosplenomegaly, which are very common in these diseases. And some of them can also lead to ascites. Both of these can cause abdominal distension. Very important one. Jaundice along with lymphadenopathy occurs in cytomegalovirus disease. Okay. Uh, then HIV, hepatitis B virus, HBV is hepatitis B, the lymphoma, and secondary malignancy. Now, all of you, please focus here. What is the relation of lymphadenopathy and jaundice here? Now, there are different types of jaundice. Probably you have discussed before. These are called prehepatic jaundice, hepatocellular jaundice, and post-hepatic jaundice. Hepatocellular jaundice is usually uh, occurred as a result of damage to the parenchyma of liver. And post-hepatic jaundice is because of obstruction of bile flow. So these two are important mechanism of jaundice along with lymphadenopathy in this case. 
one of the very important mechanism is enlargement of lymph node which are near to the porta hepatis so if these lymph nodes are enlarged they will cause compression of the common bile duct or hepatic duct okay or whatever bile duct are present near that area then it can results in jaundice shortness of breath or breathing difficulty along with lymphadenopathy occurs in mediastinal mass can cardiac involvement many of the diseases can result this like mediastinal mass is seen in tuberculosis sarcoidosis different types of lymphoma isn't it and cardiac involvement it can also occur as a result of tuberculosis remember there is a, a type of tb known as pericardial tb which can cause pericardial effusion so who knows the uh, different types of tb occur in different parts of the body and that can result in lymphadenopathy somewhere and cardiac involvement somewhere dysphagia okay. dysphagia means difficulty in swallowing now for difficulty uh, in swallowing which structure needs to be affected which structure we all know that esophagus exactly pharynx or esophagus isn't it pharynx or esophagus so then only dysphagia occurs so these are very common in some of the tumors which may give compression to the esophageal area as a result of mediastinal lymphadenopathy again like non hodgkins lymphoma tuberculosis rhabdomyosarcoma and sometimes even by histoplasmosis again by causing mediastinal lymphadenopathy visual problem can occur in neuroblastoma because this neuroblastoma can metastasize behind the eyeball very commonly in the orbit and they can compress the visual pathway there hematuria is appearance of blood in the urine can be seen in sle and tuberculosis this is known as renal tuberculosis or tuberculosis of the kidney or urinary tract so these are some of the important question we should not forget to ask okay so let's move on now ask about past medical history like history of tuberculosis in the past any recurrent or other chronic infection in the past history of blood transfusion in the past or not they may provide you important clue for the present diagnosis see this the good example here cytomegalovirus and hiv can be there in the patient which are in relation to previous blood transfusion even hepatitis b can be included here history of contact with tb should be asked because tuberculosis is a very common cause of generalized lymphadenopathy pet in the family should be asked like cat are commonly associated with toxoplasmosis and cat scratch disease history of drug ingestion should be asked or any treatment taken for particular illness or infection should be asked this is a standard part of history taking history of immunization should be asked all the time okay like mmr uh, why mmr uh, you know is mentioned here because rubella is a common cause of lymphadenopathy but you can include so many other example here okay this is not the only one developmental history is asked all the time in pediatric age group and i already talked about this gaucher disease and nyman pick disease are known as lipid storage disorder uh, where they can cause developmental regression so if we do not ask about this developmental history will easily miss this year okay family history similar complaint in the family any illness in the family like tuberculosis or hiv should always be asked so these are some of the important history now after doing history let's move on to the general physical examination how we examine the child who is presented with lymphadenopathy anthropometry okay is the first one which we do now what is anthropometry yes what do you mean by this uh, anyone so it is a study of the measurement and proportion of the human body it's to be simple exactly absolutely i agree with you this is the measurement of the different body parts of the child like height 
is a measurement weight is a measurement head circumference is the measurement chest circumference is the measurement mid arm circumference is another one upper lower segment ratio is another one so all of these are called anthropometry one of the important pediatric examination so why are we doing it here that's the question see here decrease height and decrease weight means the child is having malnutrition and malnutrition is quite commonly occurring in chronic illness or chronic diseases tuberculosis and malignancy are good example here record the vital signs we do this all the time okay only two vital signs are mentioned here but don't forget the remaining three as well heart rate or pulse blood pressure respiratory rate temperature and pulse oximetry is the fifth one so increase in heart rate or increase pulse occur in febrile condition and anemic condition and increase in blood pressure occur in sle or other connective tissue diseases and neuroblastoma because neuroblastoma uh, occurring uh, from the sympathetic neurons like adrenal medulla is the one which is usually affected here so there is a logic isn't it so it is uh, causing high blood pressure regarding the local examination now okay share so what we do we inspect that local area first which is complained by the patient for example if a child is having swollen you know cervical lymph node the mother complain doctor i can see something there or i can feel something there so we inspect or look at that area first so how many numbers of the lymph nodes are seen where are they and how the surface of the lymph node looks like remember this is just the inspection we'll confirm it in palpation later on okay now uh, palpation where exactly we sight if it occurs in the neck there are so many different lymph node group in the neck to be very precise okay uh, let me you know uh, take those names now sub mandibular lymph node it's a part of the cervical lymph node sub mental lymph node is also a part upper deep cervical group of lymph nodes okay lower deep cervical group of lymph nodes lymph nodes in the posterior triangle of the neck supraclavicular lymph node occipital lymph node pre and post auricular lymph node so many different groups are there so which exactly where so i need to you know mention those now how many number okay how many lymph nodes have i palpated i need to mention that is there rise in local temperature or not are these lymph node tender or not what about the surface of the lymph node and the margin can i feel the margin all around or not and if i cannot feel are they matted or not whether they are fixed to the surrounding structure or overlying skin or not these are very very important local examination finding so let me clarify these you know though i have already you know uh, elaborated these things in some prior topics if you remember now if you feel you know those lymph nodes and if if it feels hot that means they are infected usually by bacterial infection okay then only they are hot tenderness is also a common feature of bacterial infection sometimes even in viral infection it can be seen and very rarely even in malignancy surface and margin are always felt okay discrete means i can feel the margin all around and if the margins are attached with each other i call that matted lymph node and matted lymph node is a feature of tuberculosis and the last part if the lymph node is fixed to the surrounding structure like muscle okay fascia any other soft tissue that is a highly suggestive of malignancy and sometimes even the overlying skin is attached to that lymph node it is again a feature of malignancy and when i palpate those malignant lymph nodes feel very hard okay they feel very hard so these are very very important point
Let's move on. Now, the thing which I explained to you are highlighted here once again. So all of the student, please pay attention. These are absolutely important concept for you, okay, for future. Bacterial adenitis, if it is the cause of lymphadenopathy, then we should note these things. In which region of the body they are? Are they in cervical? Are they axillary or inguinal? Are they discrete or not? Are they tender or not? Whether there is redness overlying those lymph nodes or not? And whether they are fluctuant or not? Now, fluctuation, if it is present, what does that mean? Yes. Sometimes this, swelling, sometimes not, just like this. In this case, you know, just correlate this case, what we are talking right now, we are talking about lymphadenopathy, which is caused by bacteria. Now, in that region, if there is fluctuation test positive, what does that mean? Lower That's the fluid. question. Yes? Presence of fluid. Having fluid Presence swelling. Of fluid. So which, fluid. which fluid is this? This is pus. This is absolutely pus. straightforward. Clear fluid at pus. This is pus, okay? Because I'm talking about bacterial infection now. So it has to be pus. Okay. So fluctuation test is positive in cyst. But I'm not talking about cyst here. I'm talking about infection of the lymph node. So that lymph node must have converted into abscess. And that abscess is causing positivity of the fluctuation test. But it may not be present all the time. If there is no abscess formation, the fluctuation test is negative. Okay, so it depends on the situation. In case of tuberculosis, okay, see there. In case of tuberculosis, the lymph nodes are matted. They are non-tender. And there may be sinus formation in a chronic case. In case of Hodgkin's disease, they are non-tender. And it's a very, very important point. It is called rubbery inconsistency. When we peel these lymph nodes, they felt like we are feeling a rubber ball. So it is rubbery inconsistency. Important MCQ question in the exam. If these are malignant lymph node, they are hard to palpate. Very important point. And they are fixed to the underlying structure or overlying skin. And if there are multiple nodes involved, look for generalized lymphadenopathy. Palpate on other area as well. Okay. So these are the important point in characteristics of the node. Let's move on. Now, examine for pallor. Now, you, you should answer this question. It is very easy for you. If lymphadenopathy occurs along with pallor, what are the diseases you think of? Uh, sorry, which, anemia. Which type of anemia? Okay, so it may be a bit difficult question because we have not discussed hematology. So let me answer this. If pallor occurs along with lymphadenopathy, then probably it is, it is a chronic disease which is causing lymphadenopathy because there is a type of anemia known as anemia of chronic disease, which is resulting in pallor, one. Another, in hematological malignancy or lymphoma, by causing bone marrow involvement, okay, or in any type of metastatic disorder, by causing the bone marrow involvement, there is pallor. And lymph lymphadenopathy is also very common in them. So this is the way you should correlate the things here. Icterus means jaundice, cyanosis, pedal edema, and clubbing. These are the standard general you know, physical examination. We should always examine, examine them. Uh, JVP is raised in case of lymphoma, but how? because it may be compressing superior vena cava. If superior vena cava is compressed, there is raise in JVP. So you all know that. You must be studying this in internal medicine. Rashes over the body should be examined, examined for skin nodules, okay, or nodes formation on the skin, which may be seen in tuberculosis, acute myeloid leukemia, 
chronic myeloid leukemia, Hodgkin's disease, sarcoidosis, histoplasmosis, and some of the drug reaction like sulfonamide. Some rashes or nodules may be present on the skin. Dysmorphism means the facial appearance doesn't look good or doesn't look normal. Think about Down syndrome here. But Down syndrome alone doesn't cause lymphadenopathy. But we also know Down syndrome is immunocompromised condition. The child repeatedly getting many different types of infection. Even ALL is very common in Down syndrome. So as a result of that, lymph nodes enlargement is quite commonly seen. And the, what is the face of Down syndrome child looks like? What we call that face? What is the common term we use for that face? It is it is Mongolian not face. Mongolian, uh, Mongols, these are exactly, face. exactly. Mongoloid face. Mongolian. Okay, Mongoloid face. Good. This is known as Mongoloid face. So let me write this for you. That's why it is known as dysmorphism. Mongoloid face. So it looks, it looks like a Mongolian race. Chinese people, Japanese people, and Korean people. They are called Mongolian race. So the child face looks like that. That is the meaning. And bony tenderness occurs very commonly in leukemia and other type of malignancy if they have involved the bone. So these are important general physical examination we should do if we want to diagnose this case of lymphadenopathy. Now, some other examinations are oral examination and ear or ear, nose and throat examination, also known as ENT examination. See there, some important information we get from this examination. Like, if streptococcal pharyngitis is the case, we can see push point in the tonsil. And in this case, submandibular lymph nodes are enlarged. Submandibular lymph nodes are also known as tonsillar lymph node. If petechiae in oral mucosa is seen, this is suggestive of Epstein Barr virus infection or infectious mononucleosis. There are so many other features in Epstein Barr virus infection now, like tonsillitis, pharyngitis, hepatosplenomegaly, and generalized lymphadenopathy. This is a special topic you study in medicine. Gum bleeding is seen in okay, platelet disorder like thrombocytopenia and AML or ALL as well. Because of decreased platelet count, there is bleeding from the gum. Very important manifestation. Gum hypertrophy commonly seen in AML, acute myeloid leukemia. It is seen in other conditions also, like phenytoin therapy. Okay, It is seen in vitamin C deficiency also. Which disease occurs in vitamin C deficiency? Which disease? Scurvy disease. Very good. Scurvy. Absolutely, scurvy. scurvy. Very good, scurvy. So remember, if, if we ask about what are the causes of hypertrophy or hyperplasia of the gum, you can confidently answer these things. AML, acute myeloid leukemia, phenytoin therapy, okay, scurvy, and when the hygiene, the local hygiene is not good, somebody is not cleaning the teeth for a long time, these are the causes. But if I say, what are the causes of gum hypertrophy along with lymphadenopathy, now your answer would change, okay? AML is a, a common answer and phenytoin also you can add here. Now oral ulcers along with lymphadenopathy occurs in leukemia and SLE and strawberry tongue, very important MCQ question in the exam, commonly occurs in Kawasaki disease and scarlet fever, okay? Kawasaki disease is a type of connective tissue disorder and scarlet fever is caused by which organism? Which yes, organism? Absolutely. Okay. So all of the students know that. I'm sure about it. Streptococcus pyogenes or group A beta hemolytic streptococci. You can answer in any way. So in that condition, body rashes, uh, tonsillitis, and strawberry tongue is commonly found. Uh, air examination is another part uh, which may show 
bacterial infection if there is pus in the middle ear and if there is pus discharge from the middle ear for a longer duration for a chronic type of otorrhea we think about tuberculosis and rhabdomyosarcoma sometimes but usually these are a rare type of causes for otorrhea okay so let's move on now what about eye examination eye examination also can provide us a lot of important information especially in chronic type of lymphadenopathy like conjunctivitis bacterial or viral infection usually leads to conjunctivitis conjunctivitis means red eye inflammation of conjunctiva and even kawasaki disease can cause bulbar conjunctivitis okay this is known as bulbar conjunctivitis in kawasaki disease now flicten or flictenular conjunctivitis commonly seen in tuberculosis now flicten is a type of nodule which is seen in case of tuberculosis it's a it's a small granuloma which occurs in the conjunctiva that is called flicten and when i take a biopsy from that flicten uh, it will show tubercular granuloma itself uveitis commonly occurs in see there in jra juvenile rheumatoid arthritis this is inflammation of the uvea uvea is one of the layer of our eyeball inflammatory reaction in the eye can occur in sle and sarcoidosis very non specific type of you know feature chorioretinitis otherwise is is a bit specific seen in toxoplasmosis and even in cytomegalovirus infection chorioretinitis choroid is a part of uvea and retinitis means inflammation of the retina these are layers of our eyeball retinal hemorrhage occurs in leukemia or bleeding disorder cherry red spot very important point occurs in nyman pick disease and gauss's disease now both of these are a lipid storage disorder now why cherry red spot is seen in eye examination now listen very carefully here okay so let me explain this point for you when we do okay when we do ophthalmoscopic exam or fundoscopic exam this is called fundoscopic exam of the eye okay there is one very bright area on the retina okay? that is called fovea fovea or fovea centralis now what happens in these uh, different conditions is they don't uh, you know get collected in this fovea means those abnormal substance which are deposited in uh, these uh, uh, you know lipid storage diseases they don't get collected in the fovea but they are collected all on other areas of retina so when we watch we can see the underlying blood vessels very clearly from that fovea and that underlying blood vessels okay gives rise to a picture just like a cherry red spot so that's why if cherry red spot is seen in the retina during the fundoscopic exam this is highly suggestive of okay lipid storage diseases try to remember this and proptosis what is proptosis there it is the protrusion of eye also known as exophthalmos in the eye abnormal displacement of eye very good this is exophthalmos excellent this is exophthalmos is another term for proptosis this is pushing the eyeball outward one of the common condition along with lymphadenopathy is neuroblastoma because it usually metastasize on the back side of the eyeball so it will push the eyeball further okay uh, i mean in the frontal in the frontal aspect the eyeball is pushed and we call it proptosis now okay we are coming towards the end of this examination and after that when investigation is left remember this is a clinical type of discussion okay it may sound a little bit vague and a bit difficult right now but trust me when you start working as a doctor these are the one okay which will help you in the diagnosing the cases now regarding the systemic examination abdomen 
chest and other system examination would be done systematically so regarding the abdominal exam note abdominal distension note for hepatosplenomegaly and any masses there or ascites present or not and these are the different causes of hepatosplenomegaly this is never a complete list okay there are so many other causes but these are the common one tuberculosis hiv epstein barr virus rubella leishmaniasis what is leishmaniasis um protozoa sir sir it is a disease which is transmitted by sand fly uh, and sir it is by uh, uh, leishmania which is a protozoa very good excellent answer leishmaniasis is also known as kala azar visceral leishmaniasis is known as kala azar it is caused by leishmania donovani which is a type of protozoa and the vector is sand fly absolutely so you know in in tropical countries this is very common disorder bacterial sepsis histoplasmosis leukemia and lymphoma jra and sle gaucher disease and nyman pick disease all of them can lead to hepatosplenomegaly abdominal mass or ascites is seen in tuberculosis and malignancy okay so we should examine the abdomen quite nicely regarding the chest examination if there is tracheal deviation if there is tracheal deviation that means something is pushing on the trachea so it may be a case of lymphoma because lymphoma is a mass of the lymphoid tissue if it occurs in the mediastinum it may push the trachea on the other side examine for bilateral air entry or added sound examine for plural, plural effusion if it is there or not collection of the free fluid in pleural cavity is called pleural effusion and it may be seen in these conditions like tuberculosis pneumonia or bacterial infection lymphoma jra and sle all of these so many other causes are there examine for infiltration in the chest which may be caused by malignancy and nyman pick disease now we can cannot uh, find this infiltration during our examination of the chest these are very easily picked by chest x ray or the chest radiograph let's move on now examine for the remaining system quickly if you think these are relevant otherwise we we don't need to examine all of them cardiovascular system examine for any murmur or examine for pericardial effusion it may have connection with lymphadenopathy like tuberculosis again viral myocarditis jra and sle all of them can involve the cardiovascular system and they can also cause lymphadenopathy so that's the connection regarding the nervous system examine for general or focal neurological sign means whether there is any paralysis or not whether there is involvement of the cranial nerve or not this is the meaning examine for signs of meningeal irritation okay like neck rigidity kernig sign or brudzinski sign and these are usually caused by virus bacteria or tubercular organism infiltration of the brain can occur in these different malignancies see there all and aml both but all uh, you know causes infiltration more than aml hodgkins and non hodgkins lymphoma secondary malignancy if it has gone to the brain and neuroblastoma sle can lead to affection of our brain sle can cause memory loss cognitive impairment and neuropsychiatric feature so if we do not examine the nervous system we will miss these things that's the meaning and gaucher and nyman pick disease can cause neurodegeneration means death of the neuron and by causing that they lead to regression of the development the child forget okay whatever the skill he or she has learned this is called developmental regression so these are some of the important systemic examination we have to do if a child comes with lymphadenopathy now the last part which is very easy for us okay i can go quickly regarding this 
investigation. Now, you can revise these on your own, but I'll only highlight the important points here. Let me, uh, you know, talk about the heading first. So what are the investigation heading? Which investigation you need uh, to do if you want to reach to the diagnosis? One is CBC, complete blood count. Now see there, hemoglobin, total leukocyte count, okay? These are called differential leukocyte count, neutrophil, lymphocyte, eosinophil, basophil, monocyte, okay? Platelet, all of these are part of CBC and they can provide us information. Like if there is anemia, think about chronic disease disorders. Total leukocyte count, if it is increased, think about infection, think about malignancy, especially if neutrophil count is high, think about pyogenic bacterial infection or again malignancy. If lymphocyte count is increased, think about viral infection, okay, or chronic bacterial diseases where lymphocytes are again higher. Or think about malignancy like leukemia where lymphocytes are high. Okay, so this is the concept I'm, I'm trying to provide here for you. So accordingly, I will reach to the diagnosis. If your snowfill counts are high, think about parasitic illness or infection. Sometimes they are also seen in tuberculosis, toxoplasma gondii, Hodgkin's disease, and sarcoidosis. And basophilia is seen in CML, chronic myeloid leukemia. I'm sure you know the meaning of this. Basophilia means, what is basophilia? Sir, there is an increased basophil count in blood. Exactly. Increased number of basophil. Exactly. Increased number of basophil. Exactly. Yosinophil and basophil uh, are increased. We call it yosinophilia and basophilia. Okay. If lymphocyte is increased, we call it lymphocytosis. If neutrophil is increased, we call it neutrophilia. So these are the important terms. Now, ESR is another important, you know, hematological examination we do. Then platelet, already talked about. This is called peripheral smear. This is the bone marrow examination, man to test, and chest X-ray. All of these can provide important information related to the diagnosis. But we don't do this, you know, every investigation in a single patient, right? So it will be guided by our history taking and physical exam. Then only we plan our investigation. That's the meaning. So see here, let me move further. Echocardiography is another uh, important investigation uh, which will show some of the features of Kawasaki disease. Now, I have not taught you about Kawasaki disease but probably in, in pathology, you have studied it before. So can anyone tell me what is the manifestation of Kawasaki disease in the heart? Anybody? Mm. Sir, the Kawasaki disease, sir, uh, uh, sir, there is the inflammation, sir, in the arteries vein, uh, mainly, sir, in the Kawasaki disease, as far as CBS is concerned. Okay, good. Good. So you can, you can uh, you know, directly say coronary artery is affected in Kawasaki disease. So over a period of time, that, Kawas that coronary artery may develop aneurysm. So this is called coronary artery aneurysm, which is caused by Kawasaki disease. And that can be fixed by echocardiography, okay? Now, culture of the blood, pus, and throat swab culture should be done. This is an important part of our investigation. And re related to this topic, probably the most important investigation is biopsy of the lymph node. So before I you know, end this class, let me discuss a little bit about what are the indication of lymph node biopsy if a patient has uh, lymphadenopathy. See here, if there is persistent or unexplained fever, weight loss, night sweat, hard nodes, or the nodes which are fixed to the surrounding tissue, we think about or uh, some you know, malignancy or some chronic disorder. So better to take lymph node biopsy. If there is increase in size over the baseline in two weeks time, we should go for lymph node biopsy. 
if there is no decrease in size even after the treatment in 4 to 6 week better to go for lymph node biopsy to find out the cause if the lymph nodes are not regressing to normal in 8 to 12 weeks and if there are development of new sign and symptom along with persistent lymphadenopathy better to go for lymph node biopsy just to find out you know a uh, different complicated condition in time like malignancy connective tissue disorder or some chronic diseases that is the meaning now this is the final slide okay you can see this on your own these are the serological test uric acid and calcium liver function and renal function test ct scan or bone scan these all can be done according to the situation okay remember this so this is the discussion about approach to child with lymphadenopathy